The Hubble telescope orbits our planet, looking out at the big unknown universe. Since it's out of our atmosphere, the Hubble can see way further than telescopes on land. No clouds up there. This guy helped us confirm the theory about supermassive black holes in the center of galaxies. It also discovered a whole bunch of new galaxies, including the world's oldest one, which is about 8 billion years older than our own. But let's travel 25 light years away to another special star, Fomalhaut. It's one of the brightest stars in the night sky, and it's in the constellation Southern Fish. It's almost twice as big and heavy as the Sun. If you look at it from far away, you can see a bright yellow disk around it. It's a debris disk full of bits of space rock, and it's huge. Its width is about 25 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Scientists were curious about it. Was all this space dust going to get smushed together and become a planet one day? But then they saw something else. Right there, through all that debris, was a massive, mysterious object. A large yellow dot orbiting the star. It looked like it was skating around a cosmic ice ring. So, in 2008, scientists announced they had discovered an exoplanet called Fomalhaut b. It was the first planet outside of our solar system that we could actually see with our own eyes. It's hard to know how heavy it is. Probably like a couple of Mars is put together. And it lives pretty far from its host star, about four times the distance from the Sun to Neptune. One year on the planet would be the same as 1,700 Earth years. We'd all be babies over there. So, one question. Does the planet even really exist? Scientists sat around arguing about it. Then, in 2012, the trusty Hubble telescope came up with some new data. It was real all along. If it was a gas giant like Jupiter or Saturn, that would make it incredibly young, 10 times younger than Earth. And all that dust around it seems to shine nonstop. You'd have to wear sunglasses 24-7. But now, it's disappeared again. Nothing but a donut of debris. So? Maybe it was destroyed by a giant asteroid, like the one that wiped the dinosaurs off the face of the Earth. Or it may have been crushed by a rogue planet. These are planets that fly around the galaxy without a clear orbit. Maybe the dust is all that's left from a head-on collision. Or maybe something went crazy in the planet's core, and it exploded from within. Scientists now believe that Fomalhaut b was never actually a planet in the first place. It was just the leftovers of two big rocks smashing together. From far away, that kind of massive collision would actually just look like a yellow dot. These two colliding space rocks must have been at least 125 miles wide. That's like DC to Philadelphia wide. But this isn't the first time a planet's just up and disappeared from view. Scientists thought they'd found an Earth-sized planet orbiting our neighbor, Alpha Centauri. They called it Alpha Centauri BB. Not exactly flashy. Plus, in the end, it turned out it didn't exist. Oops. Scientists make mistakes, just like the rest of us. Not long ago, they thought there might be life on Venus. They found traces of a special gas, phosphine, which can be a sign of life. It was the top story for a month. But then, someone decided to double-check the data. There was some phosphine floating around, but not nearly as much as they thought. Travel back in time a couple of hundred years, and you can find even sillier mistakes. Back then, people believed that the Sun revolved around the Earth, and that our planet was the center of the whole universe. That's because they didn't have fancy equipment to measure stuff. People saw the Sun rise in the east and set in the west. That was enough to say that the Sun revolved around us. So, what happened to that planet? Basically, the Hubble took a photo of the whole star system. But since it's so far away, the photo came out kind of blurry. Scientists just saw a large yellow dot and assumed it was a planet. Scientists don't usually get photos of far-off planets. They normally have to use math to find them. Space objects are in a constant dance with one another. The dance gives off a lot of energy, like gravitational energy and light energy. It's like this. Say your friend is hiding behind a corner. You can't see him, but you can see his shadow on the floor. It's kind of like what scientists do when they look out into the stars, searching for planets. 
So, big deal, a planet vanished billions of miles from here. But what if our perfectly balanced solar system were to lose one of its planets? You better believe it would affect our lives. Mercury's up first. Good news, it's too small to have a gravitational effect on our planet. So we wouldn't even notice if it went missing. Next in line is Venus. This hot planet is sometimes called Earth's twin sister. It's completely uninhabited, of course. Other than that, Venus is one of the brightest spots in our night sky. Pull it out of the solar system and whoa, it's much darker at night. But still, not exactly a big deal. Mars. Life without Mars might even be good for the Earth. There's an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Mars's gravity can grab an asteroid from the belt, spin it around, and catapult it toward us. Without Mars, the asteroids would stay in place thanks to Jupiter's gravity. Jupiter's heavier than all the planets in our solar system combined. It holds back the asteroid belt, and its gravity is actually strong enough to affect the Earth. A couple of thousand years after it disappears, we'd notice big changes. We'd move closer to the Sun, which means a couple of things. One, we'd have much hotter weather all year round, and two, our days, weeks, and years would be shorter. Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are all too far away for us to notice if they go missing. That just leaves one. No, not Pluto. What if the Moon disappeared? Basically, chaos. The Earth would tilt even more than it already does, and the weather worldwide would go crazy, even crazier than now. It might even lead to a new ice age. The Earth would start spinning a lot faster, so instead of 24 hours in a day, we might have anywhere between 6 to 12. And even though nights would be a whole lot shorter, they'd also be darker than ever. When we see the moon, we're actually seeing the sun reflecting its light off the moon. And even a new moon is usually the brightest object in the night sky. If the sun were to disappear from our sky, it would be pretty much game over. This star is the center of our whole solar system. Without it, the orbits of all the planets would collapse, and we'd move around in complete chaos. The Earth, the Moon, and all the other neighboring planets would just shoot out into the universe, heading for… well, we just don't know. Daytime would be a thing of the past. We'd need the sun for that. So it would be nighttime forever. We'd probably never see the moon again. We'd probably never see anything again. The Earth would get colder and colder, and all the water on the planet would gradually freeze. But what if the sun turned into a black hole? We might still orbit around it. Hopefully we're far enough away from it to stay safe. Mercury and Venus might be swallowed up, but we might get lucky. So we'd stay where we are, but we wouldn't have the sun to warm us. If it happened slowly enough, we might be able to adapt. We'd need a new power source, a new light source, and plants would have to adapt to get their energy from somewhere else. We'd probably need to build a huge tent-like thing over every city, forest, ocean. Or we might just jump ship and move to another planet. The Brightside Channel is happy to announce the first video of a recently discovered secret star map of great antiquity and significance. We are presenting to you Archaeo Astronomy. Cleverly hidden in the Southern Hemisphere stars, this map predates any of the early star maps published by the Dutch or English explorers of the 16th and 17th centuries. Just imagine, this map served as a navigational guide for the early 16th century Spanish Empire's naval expeditions below the equator. It also provided the geographic locations of natural resources in the New World. If anything was top secret back then, this star map indeed rated that designation. When above Earth's equator, sailing vessels used the North Star as their directional guide. Located almost directly above the North Pole, the North Star, Polaris by name, remains the only motionless star in the sky as the Earth spins during the night. Time delay photographs centered on the North Star show star trails of the circumpolar stars, while the North Star remains virtually in the same spot. Above the equator, Polaris is a sure signpost to the north. The height or altitude you see Polaris above water tells you your latitude above the equator. But below the equator of Earth, the North Star is not visible. Below the equator, there is no South Pole Star. As the expedition of vessels under the flag of Spain approached the equator, 
the North Star continued to drop lower and lower behind the stern of the ships. It became evident to the Spanish and Portuguese sailors on board that Polaris would soon descend below the waves and no longer be visible to guide them. The sailors became anxious, sailing into unknown waters without a directional guide. That's when they created the first constellation of the secret star map of the Southern Hemisphere, Crux, the Southern Cross. A bright constellation appearing in front of the bow of their ships gave the sailors confidence that they had a navigational guide for their journey south. Crux is portrayed on the flags of several sub-equatorial countries of the Southern Hemisphere. New Zealand, Australia, Samoa, and Papua New Guinea, all in the South Pacific, as well as Brazil in the South Atlantic. These vastly different geographical locations are essential for unraveling discrepancies between the modern constellations and the secret star map, as we shall soon see. The second constellation created by the sailors on their secret star map was at least as necessary as Crux, but far smaller and dimmer, tiny in fact. Made of just a few dim stars, the Musca constellation, the fly, was a welcome discovery to the sailors, at least as welcome as seeing the Southern Cross. The Southern Celestial Hemisphere contains many more stars than the Northern Celestial Hemisphere. The Southern sky is literally packed with stars. It's because our Sun is somewhat above the middle of the disk of the Milky Way. When people on Earth above the equator look up, we look out of the Milky Way. People in the Southern Hemisphere are looking down into the disk of the galaxy and see many more stars, nebulae, planetary nebulae, and the Milky Way's companion galaxies the large and small Magellanic clouds. It's why Southern Hemisphere astronomy contains many of the newest, biggest, and most powerful telescopes and observatories. There's so much more to see from down under. Why then, among the vast multitude of stars in the southern sky, is the dim little constellation Musca so important? Why would the sailors place this on their secret star map, right below the Southern Cross? Because, on a ship, if a fly bites you, it's good news. A fly can only mean one thing. The land is near. And after sailing from Spain, the land was a very welcome sight. The next constellation placed on the secret star map is off to the ship's port side. Heading south, the port side, or left side, would be to the east, toward the archipelago of islands off the coast of Brazil. The third constellation is another dim minor constellation, the Chameleon. The Chameleon served as a secret code for expeditions to follow. It means, don't go there. Well, okay, go there if you want chameleons for dinner, but not much else. No natural resources. The constellation of the Chameleon is a no-go sign. Don't be fooled by these islands. They're mostly barren. Bare to the starboard. That's where the mainland is. Another no-go sign further east of Chameleon is Bolands, the flying fish. Not anything for the dinner table either. Maintain your heading southwest. Now, as we head down the coast, we can begin to overlay the secret star map onto the map of South America. When we do that, we immediately encounter an anomaly, the constellation Apis, the bird of paradise. Apis doesn't jive with South America, birds of paradise are indigenous to the islands of the South Pacific, not South America. We're going to see as we continue our journey around South America, following the star map developed by the Spanish and Portuguese sailors, that many birds are depicted in various locations. Therefore, the constellation Apis is properly located on the mainland of South America as a conspicuously beautiful bird, but not a bird of paradise. Maybe the sailors saw a banded Cotinga, or perhaps a Stresemann's bristle front, or any of several kinds of brightly colored parrots. Or perhaps, even more likely, the white-tipped Quetzal, which lives in Venezuela and Guiana. In any case, Apis denotes a bird with a forest habitat, a valuable natural resource for the Spanish Empire to exploit. Sailing between the Chameleon and Apis, Spanish ships hugged the coast of the great landmass of South America. Passing the mouth of the then-unnamed Amazon River, the sailors marked the location with the constellation Hydrus, the water snake, a clear icon of what the Amazon had to offer. Cape Branco, or Cabo Branco in Portuguese, marks the easternmost point of land on the South American continent. There's a tastier dish in the sky and sea off its shores, Dorado, the swordfish, a pricey item still on the menus of upscale Portuguese restaurants. 
a valuable marine resource. Dorado sure beats chameleons and flying fish for dinner, and the ship's rations of salt pork. The toucan is the next bird on our star map as the ship cruises down the coast on what is now called the Brazilian Ocean Current. The presence of tucana in this location, comparable to Argentina, indicates the natural resource of nuts and fruits. Next up is the constellation of the Phoenix. The Phoenix is an immortal bird of classic mythology. It rises from all consuming flames and is reborn. Our sailors at this point have sailed further south than any European had ever gone. Their destination was the Spice Islands near India, and they were way off course. The landscape on shore had become frightening. Tierra del Fuego, the land of fire with active volcanoes spewing molten lava. Overhead, never before seen aurorae lit up the night sky with undulating curtains of red, green, and blue. The current had turned against them and become cold. The ship struggled to navigate the Strait of Magellan, the doorway to the Pacific. The constellation of the Phoenix represents their successful entry into the Pacific and long-awaited turn northward. They were liberated from the land of fire and felt reborn as they finally were able to turn north. And this is where all published star maps since 1603 place Grus, the constellation of the crane. But Grus is not a crane. Cranes don't live in South America. It's time we clear up the mystery of the mixed-up constellations. Apis isn't a bird of paradise. Grus isn't a crane. And we are going to see that Pavo isn't a peacock. All of the mixed-up constellations are a product of a star chart published by the Dutch cartographer, that's mapmaker, Petrus Plancius, 1552 to 1622 based on celestial observations made by one Peter Kaiser on the island of Madagascar. Madagascar was discovered by a Portuguese expedition of 13 ships in 1500 and visited often by Portuguese sailing vessels in subsequent centuries. It appears that Peter Kaiser may well have known a Portuguese sailor who communicated to him the constellations of the Southern Hemisphere that were developed by the Spanish and Portuguese sailors aboard the Spanish expeditions around South America our secret star map. Although there is no evidence to support that claim, it explains the mix-up in the identity of the constellations. They are really South American birds, as in our secret star chart, and not birds of the East Indies, like on all official modern star charts. Grus isn't a crane, it's a flamingo. Flamingos live in Chile. The sailors going up the west coast of South America saw flamingos. This very same constellation that is called Grus today had been called Phonicopterus in the early 17th century. Phonicopterus is Latin for flamingo. Grus is a flamingo. A similar misnomer occurs with the constellation Pavo, the peacock on modern star charts. Pavo is Latin for peacock. Peacocks don't live in South America either. Yes, peacocks are indigenous to the South Pacific. However, the word Pavo in Spanish means turkey. And yes, turkeys do live in Spain. But, and here's the kicker, turkey in the Portuguese language is Peru. A conspicuous bird of the country of Peru is the condor, the largest flying bird in the world. The constellation of Pavo is a condor, which is much more like a turkey than a peacock. The presence of condors means there's game meat ashore. We're now at the equator again, having sailed up the west coast of South America. And there is the constellation Indus, the river to India. The southern equatorial current heads across the Pacific at that location. And there's your secret sailor star map in its entirety. Oh, be sure to stock up on limes in Lima, Peru. It's a long trek across the Pacific. Limies, as sailors are often called, must get their vitamin C to stay healthy. Beetlejuice, a red supergiant. This ball of boiling plasma is one of the largest stars in our galaxy and one of the brightest. It's about 500 times larger than the sun. But Betelgeuse is pulsating, getting bigger and smaller. At its peak, it becomes 800 times its average size. If this star were a bucket, it would fit about 300 million suns, even though its weight is only 17 times greater. And here, about 500 light years away, is Earth. We launch our faster-than-light spaceship and set off on our journey to Betelgeuse. 
A few seconds, and we've already traveled 240,000 miles, and now are close to the moon. That's nine and a half trips around the Earth. A traditional rocket-powered spacecraft would take three days to get here. We're near Mars now. The flight to the Red Planet usually takes about seven months. Several rovers are now at work here, as well as the first ever flying drone, Ingenuity. The surface of Mars is three times smaller than that of Earth. The planet is also 10 times lighter. People hope to build a human colony here soon. Right beyond Mars, we have to wiggle and constantly dodge space rocks. This is the asteroid belt. It contains debris and space objects of different sizes and shapes. The biggest of them is Ceres. Its surface is slightly larger than the area of Argentina, and its weight is about 1% of the moon's. The total weight of the entire asteroid belt is 25 times less than the moon's. Next, we pass gas giants Jupiter and Saturn. These are the largest planets in the solar system. They're also the heaviest, even though they don't have a solid surface. Then, we travel by Uranus and Neptune. They're called ice giants. And at the very edge of the solar system, we see Pluto. It was once considered a full-fledged planet, but now it's not even on the list. After that, we're 4.3 billion miles away from our home. It took the New Horizons space probe about nine years to get here. Hold on to your seat, we are speeding up. We're passing through the Kuiper Belt. There are lots of asteroids and blocks of ice here. These are some of the oldest building materials in our solar system. Billions of years ago, our whole world looked like a cloud of these asteroids. We're traveling further through dark space and reach the edge of the solar system, the heliosphere. All this time, we've been moving with the solar wind. But now, it starts to slow down, collides with the interstellar wind, and heats up. This is called the termination shock. The Voyager 1 space probe got to this point in December 2004. We're moving to the region where the heliosphere ends and interstellar space begins. This is the heliopause. In 2012, Voyager crossed this boundary and became the first ever human-made object in interstellar space. But the message from Voyager reporting this event came to Earth almost a year later because of the huge distance. It took 35 years for Voyager 1 to travel all this way. And here it is. The probe is as long as a car and weighs like two motorcycles. You can see a gold plate on its hull. It's a message from people to potential civilizations out there. It has pictures of Earth's landscapes, recordings of human speech, and our DNA. As of 2021, Voyager has been operational for almost 43 years. The probe has traveled 14 billion miles. That's like 152 Earth to the Sun distances. And it's still making its way through space at 38,000 miles per hour. Now, we're approaching the nearest star to our solar system. It's Proxima Centauri. We're so far from home that even light needs more than four years to travel this distance. If we used a traditional rocket, the trip would take us 73,000 years. The reason we wanted to get here was because of an Earth-like planet called Proxima Centauri b. It's 10% larger than Earth and slightly heavier. It lies in the habitable zone of its host star. It means that water might exist on the planet in its liquid state, and there can be life that forms here. But the star itself occasionally produces flares. Recently, its brightness increased almost 1,000 times. During that time, it emitted so much radiation that even if there were some forms of life on the planet, they probably ceased to exist. We're now more than eight light years away from Earth. The brightest star in our night sky is Sirius. Seriously. It's so bright that you can see it even during the day. But in reality, there are actually two stars, Sirius A and B. They orbit around a common center of gravity, and these stars are moving toward our solar system at almost five miles per second. That's the same as the maximum speed of a top-of-the-line supercar on Earth. Foot down, and we've arrived at a potentially habitable planet 39 light years away from Earth. This is Trappist 1D. Its host star is a white dwarf. It's a cold star, 10 times smaller and lighter than the sun. There are seven planets around it, but Trappist 1D is the most similar to Earth. It's only 30% smaller and three times lighter, but it has a rocky surface and the temperature here is 48 degrees Fahrenheit. You'd feel comfortable here wearing a light jacket. 
there might be an atmosphere, mountains, seas, and oceans here. Which means this planet might be suitable for a human colony. But it would take about 677,000 years to get here using traditional rockets. And here's our main goal, Betelgeuse. It'd take nearly 8.7 million years to travel here from Earth in a current day spacecraft. This star is so big that our ship looks like a grain of sand on a giant beach. We have to jump back in time to find out what happened to this star. First, there was a beautiful nebula. It's a cloud of multicolored space dust and debris. Then, it began to shrink under its own weight. In the core of the nebula, a nuclear reaction began. Boom! And the star was born. At first, Betelgeuse was very massive and hot, but it didn't expand and remained stable. Let's look into its heart. The nuclear reactions in the star's core create a lot of heat and energy. This energy produces the force that pushes on the walls of the star from the inside and causes it to expand. But at the same time, the star is very heavy. That's why gravity pushes on it from the outside. If these two forces are balanced, the star remains stable. But over time, the star runs out of its fuel, helium and hydrogen. That's when heavier elements in the core join the nuclear reaction. When they burn, they release more energy and heat than gravity can hold, and the star starts expanding. That's what's happening to Betelgeuse right now. It's already so big that if you put it in the center of our solar system, its edge would touch the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Betelgeuse will continue to expand until it exhausts its fuel completely. Then the gravity will win. The star will shrink in size, and then an enormous boom will happen. A supernova explosion will be so blinding that Betelgeuse will shine brighter than the moon in the night sky. Luckily, Earth is too far away for this explosion to cause any harm to people. A strong stream of matter that will be ejected from the explosion site won't reach the solar system until 6 million years later. Even so, the solar wind will stop this flow, so we'll be safe. Betelgeuse is likely to explode at any time in the next 10,000 years. But some scientists say it won't happen in the next 100 millennia. Back to the moment before the explosion of Betelgeuse. There can be another, more interesting scenario. Gravity might compress the massive core of the star with such force that a black hole will appear in its place. Black holes are the heaviest objects in the universe. They have incredible gravitational force. Even light can't escape their gravitational trap. The Betelgeuse black hole will begin feeding on cosmic dust and whatever is left of the star. All this debris and light from other stars will get frozen near the event horizon of the growing black hole. For the first time in history, we'll be able to watch the birth of this mysterious object. But in reality, Betelgeuse is too light to become a black hole. Most likely, after the explosion, it'll turn into a white dwarf that will gradually fade until it becomes invisible.